Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the short but memorable Springbok career of Justin Swart. Justin, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Now, just before we get started, let's have a look at today's trivia question. Name the sponsor that appeared on the right-hand side of the chest on the Springbok jersey in 1992. Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. And we'll also find out if Justin knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Justin, let's go back to 1996. Talk to me about how you were feeling ahead of your Springbok test debut against Fiji. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, 1996 was a weird year. Um, I, I played for Western Province in the Super Rugby. Uh, and we, I think we lost the first seven or eight. Uh, our first win came at Ellis Park, so it was a tough year. Um, and I think when Markov announced the side, it was only myself and Joel Stransky that made it from province. And I was quite a bit younger than him. Um, so, yeah, very nervous um, you know, going into that camp. We played like a warm-up game. And then we, I was actually on the bench for the Fiji game. And um, Peter Hendricks got sick or ill on the Thursday. I arrived at the team photo and they said, no, you can put on, I think it was 11. Or, yeah, you can put on 11 because Peter's not playing. So I phoned my dad and said, listen, it seems I'm, I'm starting. So best you get in the car and come. So they drove up and uh, it was actually on my mom's birthday, the 2nd of July. Um, so I made my test debut at Loftus on my mom's birthday, which was special for us as a family. Yeah. A lot of Springboks that I've had on this show have told me that their debuts went by in a flash. What do you remember about that night? Yeah, it goes by very quickly. I do remember that Henry Hannibal's fly off and hey, he had this silly move that he, off a line out, he had me running on his inside and wanted me you know, to carry the ball up. And I said... Henry, that's not a great idea because it's it's a lineup. There's a lot of loose forwards around and I might get killed. They said, no, no, trust me. And I just remember as he passed me the ball, I got hit and I actually lost my mouth guard uh, from the tackle. And um, when I eventually got up, uh, Henry, we call Lem, he just looked at me and laughed and said, at least you caught it. So, um, yeah, but it does does go by very quickly. Um, but that's what I remember from from the game. Obviously, Fiji uh, wasn't a great side, but they had great athletes in in the side. So that was a big challenge, especially on the wing. They had some phenomenal uh, runners. There was also this brand new competition uh, at that stage called the Tri Nations. How excited were you yeah. for that? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a weird period because you know we didn't really know what you know how it would go. Um, and you know we we had the the 95 box as as the core of the group and then we had all these other uh, new players in the, in the squad that they had to you know find solutions to in terms of pay and remuneration so you know that created a little bit of i guess angst in the team um but I think the focus, if I think of 96 to be honest, it wasn't really tri nations it was very important but we had the Oblex tour straight after that. Um, so I, I remember a lot of the focus, maybe not intentionally, but was on that test series when we got home. Yeah. We're going to talk about that test series in a moment, but let's first focus on the away leg of the Tri Nations. We lost narrowly yeah. against Australia and New Zealand, and you were back on the yeah. bench, but you did come off against the All Blacks. Uh, I think it was in Christchurch, yeah. if, if I'm not mistaken. How, how disappointing was it to, to lose those two test matches so narrowly? Yeah, especially especially being the world champs and the World Cup, you you, you know the expectation is that you would do better. Um, but you know, reflecting, I think it was actually a great result and uh, under very trying conditions, especially the game in Christchurch. I can't remember the score, but I don't think we lost with more than three or four. Um, you know, if you look at the test, we actually played very well. Um, hell of a disappointing to to lose, but I think all in all. It wasn't a bad result if you take into account how we did the following couple of years. Um, it is a bit difficult to tour there. Um, they don't make it easy for you. And, and um, 
very special to be able to play or be involved in a test match in New Zealand, especially on the South Island, you know, where rugby is a, is a culture or religion rather. Um, yeah, it was very, a very special occasion for me to be able to, you know, I sat on the bench for most of it and came on and lost 10 or whatever. But just to to be there was very special, yeah. The score was actually 15-11, and I remember the New Zealanders making a point uh, of that because obviously the year before the score was 15-12, but, you know, whatever. Um, we then came home uh, for the Tri-Nations, beat the Wallabies, and then we were actually on top against the All Blacks at Newlands. And that's when Francois Pinot suffered a concussion, went off the field, and then things, the wheels maybe started to come off. What do you remember about that night in Cape Town? Yeah, I think was – I think James might have been – uh, he was ex excluded because he went out in Cape Town. I think so. And we also, we also, I think, lost Os uh, Durant. Uh, I think he got injured. He did come back later in the year, but he also went off. Yeah, it's just, you know, you think back and it's, you're leading it. Uh, I mean, for me then, it was my home ground. I grew up in, in, in the Cape, so Newlands. It was super special to be able to play. Um, and then to give up the lead or... To lose the game in the end was hell of a disappointing. But again, you know, if, if we look back, that 96, 95 All Black side was a great rugby side. And I think they had the bulk, if not all of their 95 World Cup players come out in 96. Um, so, yeah, very disappointing. But it was a, a great occasion for me to be able to play and participate in the test match at Newlands. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? It's my dream, guys, to do this full time, and with a small financial contribution, you can help me realize that dream. The link and the QR code is appearing on your screen right now, and I'll also put it down in the description area for you to go and click on at a later stage if you would like to do so. And by becoming a patron, I promise there will be great benefits for members. Now let's get back to the interview. We said we'd talk about the series against the All Blacks, and that is now the point where we've arrived. Uh, a three-test match series straight after that uh, Newlands Tri-Nations match, Durban, Loftus, and uh, Ellis Park. We lost the series, becoming the first Springbok team to lose a series at home against New Zealand. I suppose the logical question is, what went wrong? Sure. Yeah, that's a tough, tough question to answer, to be honest. Um, you know, so we... I don't know if we could, you know, say we lost Francois, although he was very influential in the team and he's, you know, still to 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 today one of the great captains of South Africa. Um, so obviously his absence, you know, was, you know, we felt it, but also we were trying to find ourselves against a very good New Zealand side with the same core players, same coach, and we had a new captain quite a few new players and a new coach. So I think the result was a, a combination of, of, of that. Um, I don't think we, we played really well, to be honest. If you, if you go look at those games, especially the Durban game, we, I think we were very poor. Um, yeah, and it, it, I mean, it, for all the players involved, uh, I think we all tried and the effort was there and the passion. But it just, you know, it just didn't happen. And it's not a one thing that I could say we missed a kick or we did this. I just think it was a combination and maybe a transition period. I think if you look forward to the, you know, the the, the tour we had at the end of the year, I think it started to come together a little bit better there uh, because I think everyone had a little bit more time to, to get used to and to plan and to um, prepare. And obviously, the opposition in the Northern Hemisphere wasn't the same as, you know, to play Australia uh, twice and to play the All Blacks, I think we played them five times that year. Uh, they, they, they were tough. That was tough, yeah. As you say, things uh, really did go well on the end of year two in 1996. Let me ask you about Andre Markroff. How would you describe him as a coach? No, I think, I mean, obviously, he wouldn't have been coach if he wasn't competent. Um, he came out of Greek West. Uh, he had a lot of success um, out of Kimberley with, with limited resources. Um, I think he, 
he was a disciplinarian. He, I mean, first of all, he understands the game very well. Um, maybe we initially didn't we didn't play to the player's strength. Maybe more towards what he believed uh, we should play, and I think. Towards the end of the year, on tour, he started realizing, but you know, there's certain, you know, this, the team dynamics or the team talent is a little bit different to the way he wanted to play, and he adapted, and he, uh, you know, ended up on a very successful tour overseas, and that side went on to to um, achieve great things. Um, so, yeah, he was I even mean, he was my first Springbok coach. And I've got a lot of respect for him. Um, but maybe you know finding our feet against Australia and New Zealand was a tough ask for a new coach and uh, probably about 30 40 percent of the team was new and we lost Francois okay James was James um, <laughs> uh, he was in and out of the team because of disciplinary issues yeah so um yeah I rated Mark Croft as a coach yeah in terms of test matches, though, you only played again in 97 against the British and Irish Lions in the, the third test match, which we won in Johannesburg. How disappointed were you to have missed out? Yeah, especially, um, I think Carl took over from Mycroft, I think. Um, and we, we, in 97, province didn't play in the, in the, in the Super 12. We, we play all Super 10, whatever it was called then. We played in the ninth, uh, in the Vodacom Cup, which was great for province because we could rebuild Harry Fulhune came in, um, Dick Muir came, joined us, and James Small joined us. So it gave us a lot of time to find our feet. And, you know, I, uh, I, I came back from the 96 Springbok Tour very disappointed and reset and had a great start to 97. Um, and I was hoping to put myself in a position to be form a bigger part of, of the Lions series. They ended up going with Juba, which is you know obvious. But I was hoping to play a, a bit of a role on the wing or at, at, at um, off the bench, but it didn't work out. And I eventually got <laughs> got a ten minutes against the Lions in the end. Um, luckily, that's a series they also lost, and they won they won the last game, which was great to be part of that. But it was disappointing to miss out on the playing side because we went through all the prep, toured with them, and then we just released like on Thursday to go play for province and then come back on the Monday train again. So we were part of it, but, you know, very disappointing not to be on the field as any player would be, you know. <laughs> Especially, I think, the Lions is a once-in-a-career opportunity. It's almost like a World Cup. You don't know if you, you know, you're going to get that opportunity again. As you mentioned there, Harry Phil Unit uh, come in and taken over at Western Province and he had moved you uh, to fullback. And when Nick Mallet took over from Carl Duplessis, you were actually the first choice Springbok fullback for his first test match against Italy. But just before that, talk to me about how it actually came about that you switched to fullback. So, interesting, I actually played fullback at school. That was I've never played wing up to Marty's first side. So, um, a guy called Doc Poole, you know, I believe that I was a bit young. I think I was 20 when I played for Marty's first side. He said, listen, we're going to stick you on the left wing um, just so you can find your feet. And then, you know, I just got not stuck there, but, you know, I did well there. And I went on to – when Chester was overseas with a box in 92, I think they went to New Zealand, I, or 90, no, 94. Then I would play for province and I could find my feet. Um, so I played a lot of – Rugby on the left wing later, right when Chester came back, they moved me to the right, which was great. Um, and then when James came in 97, um, obviously there was a bit of a question because Chester was still with us. And also, I mean, with those two spring mocks, the only other option was fullback. So luckily it was, you know, he, he picked me initially above Peter. Uh, Peter went and played seven, uh, I think, Commonwealth. And then... Um, Unfortunately, Ches Chester got injured, uh, and fortunately for, for for Peter, when he came back, there was a spot for him on the on the wing. And they said, "Okay, but we're going to move you back and put Peter at the back." And I said, "But just give me a little bit more time because I'm quite enjoying where I am." And you know, it worked out. '97 was probably the year that I played fullback the most out of my whole career, which was actually my position I wanted to play. But yeah, that's just how it came about. 
And I think anybody who was following province closely that year will remember that you were actually in outstanding form uh, in the Curry Cup in 97. And as we said, you then played for the Springboks in the 15 jersey uh, against Italy in Bologna. And you also scored your first try for the Springboks. How satisfying was that? Yeah, especially given the disappointment of, of you know, 96, the end wasn't great. It was the Springbok tour for me personally. I ended up playing... Got dropped out of the test side, played for the dirt trackers or the B side, which was, you know, socially it was great, but, you know, you want to play for the test side. Um, and then 97, I missed out on the Lions, uh, only got a run on on the last test. So I was very really motivated to, to, you know, to try and get back into the fold. I don't think they dropped Juba. Juba took a bit of a rest um, and wasn't going on tour, and that gave me the opportunity. Um, and that's why I was picked as first choice. Um, yeah, I just remember it was a great moment, you know, scoring my first try. And we had a, actually, we played very well together as a unit against Italy that day. Um, and we, I mean, we had the ball quite a bit, so we could run around a bit. So that was great. Nice big win, but then you were replaced by Percy Montgomery. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was because of an injury, but perhaps you can just elaborate for us. Yeah, the Thursday before the first test, um, we were doing a captain's run, and I, I there's this where Lem, the flask, gives me the ball in the center of the field, and I kick it across the field, and I tore my hamstring. <laughs> and this is, I couldn't, yeah, I still can't believe it, but yeah, so that's, that's how it goes. So I missed out. The first test, the second, before the second test, um, they actually, you know, medically, they said, listen, I don't know if I'll be ready to you know, partake in the rest of the tour. And they were considering sending me home. And then, you know, James went to the to the management and said, listen, you know, what's the harm just keeping him around and, you know, see if I can, he can get back. Um, and then actually I got back and sat on the bench at Twickenham, didn't go on, luckily I think, because, you know, you think you're 100% in, you know, training you're running, um, but, you know, two and a half weeks after you tear your hamstring, you're not really ready to play. Um, and then I got a, a little bit of a run on, which is a great moment for me, um, where James uh, said to me against Scotland, he said to me, the moment I score the, uh, the, the, the record-breaking try against Scotland, I will come off. And that, those were the days before subs. So if you go look at the video, as he scored, he jumped up, ran to the bench and just did this. And, you know, I get goosebumps because he said, um, you know, your parents came out, you know, he, he would give up 15 or 20 minutes for, um, for them to see me play at Scotland. So, yeah, that was a great moment for us. That's a wonderful story, Justin. Uh, but yeah. let's talk a little bit about Percy Montgomery, right? Because in 97 at Province, you were the fullback. He was the outside centre. And that's how it was against Italy in that first test match. And then obviously with your yeah. injury, Percy then moved to fullback. How unlucky do you feel or did you feel at the time that as it turns out, you were replaced by a guy who would go on to become one of the all-time great Springbok legends? Yeah, I, mean, I think Percy would have always made it. Um, he's just, yeah, man, first Springbok Centurion, obviously. So, I'm a great rugby player. But, even you know, selfishly, I would have loved to be part of the 98, possibly 99 team because they went on and that, that side remained unchanged because they had so much success. Um, so, I missed out. But, you know, again, you, it's sad and it was tough Um to go through because I not only lost my spot in the Springbok side, I also lost my spot in the province side because of that. Um, but you know, you <laughs> you pick yourself up, you regroup, and I ended up at the Sharks, which were a great experience. Um, never really got, well, not really, I never got back into the Springbok fold, but I played some brilliant rugby and had some great times with some good mates. So, yeah, I think you got to when you reflect, you got to try and. Um, think of the positives and try and take out of that. But also, you learn that opportunities come and you've got to make sure you use it. And like, you know, I'm in a new job now. I must make sure that I use this opportunity because you don't know what's going to happen. So, yeah. But I mean, at least I got replaced by a guy that that, that be became a Springbok legend and played 100 tests. So, I mean, that's a positive. 
Earlier, I asked you uh, to tell us a little bit about Mark Croft as a coach. What can you tell us about Nick Mallet? Yeah, Nick was is uh, was is very special. He came in '96. He was our dirt tracker B team coach uh, when we went to Argentina. Uh, him and Carl took the, the the B side, and you know it was it was almost almost a separate tour. Um, although we stayed in the same locations, the test side didn't necessarily travel with us when we went and played. So, you know, it felt like we were on our own tour. And Nick, you know, he's a people's person. He obviously knows rugby very well. Very different to Andre and and Carl. Um, for, but, you know, he coached at False Bay, he coached at, at Bourland. So he, he was an experienced coach. But he was also there. He made it fun. He, we had a lot of good times with him. And then, you know, he, later on in, in his career, he became a more coach and was very successful because of his people skills, I believe. He knows rugby. Most, you know, all Springbok coaches know rugby, but you're going to have to be able to manage big egos, a lot of them. Um, and he had that knack. And he, I think, you know, that was a great experience. And also, I've got to say, a guy like Gary Teichman, um, I think they they combined very well to build a very successful side that I think went on to win 16 or 17 or 18 test matches in a row. And I think a lot of that was the synergy or the relationship between the two of them. Ironically, Nick made the mistake to drop Gary and that cost possibly cost them a better result at the World Cup. So, yeah. But Nick, great coach, a great guy to work with, yeah, very passionate. So who was your toughest opponent? Sure, there was a lot of tough opponents. I must say, I would say in South Africa, it was possibly Chris Barnos. Um, just I don't think he liked me much, but um, and he was a hell of a quick and he was aggressive and Free State played an expansive game, so he was tough to play against. I mean, when James was at Natal, he was also very tough to play with, especially he hated Christian Stewart, and he took all that hate out on me. So uh, and Chris, I mean Chris, Chris knows that they didn't get along, so it's no secret. Um, yeah, and overseas, I think Norm Berryman started this big wing story and I, I mean, when, I, when I started I mean, maybe I was 95 kgs and I was considered a relatively big wing myself Peter Hendricks James we were all similar size and then all of a sudden a small wing was 105 kgs um and hell of a quick and so Norm Berryman was too he was difficult there was a funny Buka, I think that also played for Canterbury um and then I, I played a couple of times against Lomo. Luckily, I was a fullback. I mean, he was, it was terrifying. Joey Levendieri, I marked him quite a few times. I actually got a, re, a yellow card one day at, in Auckland against him because he passed me and I just tugged him on his jersey to keep up. Um, and then the ref said, no, you can't do that. You've got to go rest for, for 10 minutes. But he was a difficult player to play against, yeah. But I must say, I'm very grateful that I don't have to mark a guy like Cheslin Kobe. Goodness gracious, that would be a nightmare. Uh, but you're not, not you know, I mean, you always had the smaller guys weren't as physical. So, you know, you, you could dominate a little bit there. But now they're so physical and they're so agile and so quick. So it must be an absolute nightmare to play against them. Is there a current player that you admire? Yeah, a lot of them. I mean, the whole. Both the World Cup squads, the last two, that uh, there's some phenomenal rugby players in there. Um, I'm a big fan of Vili Larue just because of Vili is Vili, and you know he's either very hot or he's lukewarm. Um, obviously, you know we we attended the same school, so you know we played the same position. So I'm a big fan of Vili, and I think he's having a great career, and hopefully he can get close to 100. Um, you know, maybe Andre Pollard, great player. If I have to pick one, it would be probably Peter Steph de Toy. Um, shit, but it's difficult because now you're excluding someone like Sia and and the spicy plum that I also uh, like and Eben. So, yeah, I mean, I'm going to cop out and say the whole squad. 
I don't think anybody could hold that against you, uh, Justin. Um, is there a particularly funny moment that you can share with us from your time with the Springboks? So we, we chatted about the 96, we went to Argentina, and then we went on to France. Um, and Nick Mallard, a uh, very keen coach, had these long video sessions. And we arrived somewhere in France, just the dirt trackers or the B-side. Um, and he said, okay, listen, guys, we're going to have lunch. And then we all meet in the team room, video session, two to five, and then five o'clock we go train. And uh, Dick Meir and uh, Jeremy Thompson were the centers, and they decided, no way, so this is not going to we, – we can't sit through three hours. So they gave him a sleeping tablet at, uh, at lunch. But true to Nick's form, he was wobbling, and he was – it sounded a little bit like he was drunk because of the sleeping tablet, but he made it through the video session and eventually fell asleep on the bus on the way to the training session, which I thought was very funny. And then when we got out – I mean, he could speak uh, fluent French because he played in France. Uh, and they wanted to have an interview with him. And he was, <laughs> I mean, the best description, he looked drunk, but he wasn't. He was just fast asleep because of the tablet. But uh, I found that very funny. Um, one other thing that, that uh, and I've spoken quite a bit about James, but he was such a character. We, <laughs> he got upset in one game at Newlands. I think he shouted at the Fords and then maybe Fritz van Heerden said to him to keep quiet or whatever. And he, he took offense to, to that. And then uh, we went into the change room for half time. And I just saw James go into his bag, take his car keys and leave. And then it made it half time. <laughs> and I said to Chris von Lochtenberg, that he was our fitness guy. I said, Chris, I think James just left. You, maybe just go check if he's, he's on his way to the car park. And Chris pulled up to him in his car, in the car park. He said, no, he had enough. He's leaving. And Chris had to try and convince him to come back and um, <laughs> to play the second half. Uh, yeah, but that's typical, James. Yeah. <laughs> that's quite incredible. Justin, what are you up to these uh, days? After rugby, um, I, I just changed jobs. I was 17 years with First Rand. Um, the bank... Uh, so eight years with RMB private bank, and then seven years with the FMB bank in property uh, and property finance. And now I've joined uh, a local uh, business here in South Africa that do convenient retail developments, and the business is called uh, Dorpstrad Properties. So we typically source um, opportunities and build small convenient retail centers, anything up to eighteen thousand square meters. So very different to the bank, um, yeah, but I'm enjoying it, loving it. Yeah. Great to be back in Stellenbosch where I grew up. So yeah, no, loving life at the moment. And it's a lovely part of the world as well. Justin, let's finish off by looking again at that trivia question. Name the sponsor that appeared on the right-hand side of the chest on the Springbok jersey in 1992. Do you know the answer, Justin? I'm going to guess. I'm going to say it's Castle Lager. Oh, right, Lion you, Lager. That's the one. I was going to say, if you wanted a clue, I think you had Lion Lager on your first Springbok jersey as well in 1996. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so they were the sponsors from the, since then, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's the one, Lion Lager. Justin, let me say it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today, an absolute pleasure, and I hope that we can have you on again in the future. Thanks so much for having me. Great chat. Thank you. Last time on Front Row Rugby, 2007 Rugby World Cup champion Vikas van Heerden was my guest. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, Kaya Malotana will be here.